All right. Um, <clears throat> Let's go for it. This is, this is the last lecture of the class. Uh, and for this one, uh, for everything we talked about before, it's all hardware you can buy today and actually use. And so if you wanted to go build a database system doing the stuff we talked about, you could, 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 you could do that. So for today is the only sort of like futuristic one where we're talking about storage devices that, that don't actually exist yet. Um, but we have some early prototypes that, we, that we've been using here at CMU, so we can talk a little bit about how you know, how we think this is all going to work out. Uh, so for today, we're going to talk about the background of non-volatile memory. Um, and then we'll talk about the paper that you guys were assigned to read that Joy and I wrote last year about developing different storage and recovery uh, methods inside of a database architecture that are designed to use NVM correctly. And I'll show what I mean by correctly as we go along. And then we'll finish up with talking about what will be expected for all of the groups in the, in the class when you do your code reviews of another group. So I'll talk about what, you know, what I expect for you guys to do and some basic um, an outline of the kind of questions you should be asking or, th or thinking about when you look at people's code. So, so for, for non-volatile memory, uh, the basic idea, the way you can think about it, is, is that this, it's this future storage devices that are coming along that are going to have the, almost the same read and write speeds as DRAM, but they're actually going to be persistent and durable like, like an SSD and have larger capacities, right? DRAM is obviously uh, it's a transient memory. Like you pull power, you lose everything. SSDs, they're durable, but they're much, much slower. So the idea is to sort of bridge that gap and have to be able to do uh, low-level reads and writes very quickly. And so the, kind of the, the, the thing that makes it kind of difficult or confusing about non-volatile memory is that there's no sort of standard terminology that all the different uh, companies and industries use. Uh, so sometimes they'll say storage class memory, sometimes they'll say persistent memory, sometimes they'll say MVRAM, but generally this is all the basic, the same idea, right? It's going to be as if it was DRAM, but you can, can, you can ha ensure that your writes are durable. So what's going to happen is the first devices that are going to come out are going to be essentially like the Fusion I.O. cards or the new sort of high-end Samsung uh, flash cards, right? It's going to be a PCI Express uh, interface, and then you use this sort of standard API that they developed, a uh, bunch of different manufacturers developed called NVMe, to do block-based reads and writes to the, to the device. So again, this is what's sort of confusing about the terminology is the API or the protocol you're going to use to access these things is called NVMe, but you can use that today based on flash devices that you may not consider, what I wouldn't consider being non-volatile memory, right? So the NAND flash is, is different than what we're talking about here, even though, again, you use the NVMe API. And then what will happen is, in a few, few years later, is the next set of devices are going to come out that are going to be byte addressable and fit into the actual DIMM slots uh, where DRAM goes today and have them be much, much closer to the to the CPU, and therefore you don't have to pay this huge you know, latency of going back and forth between the CPU and, P and the PCI Express bus, uh, and hopefully everything will be, will be durable. So we're not, I'm not really going to talk about what is needed to make this last one a reality in terms of from a software standpoint and the, and the operating system, right? So you, you can imagine like there's all this you know, y history and years of people writing code assuming memory is volatile, and now you throw in, you know, memory addresses that are non-volatile, right? So how do you actually program to that? So I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna ignore all that for now, and we're just gonna focus on later in the class how we actually build a database system to use it, assuming that we have sort of the operating system support uh, to make this work. So before, we, so before I can get into talk about how we do this in the database system, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what this technology actually looks like. Because I find it, this, the story, how it sort of came about in the recent years, I find is very fascinating. So I'm not an electrical engineer, uh, but, and I've never taken an electrical engineering course, but through my travels on the internet or Wikipedia, uh, you know, you learn a little bit about these things. So if you had to take a, you know, electrical engineering course today, they would teach you about sort of the fundamental elements of passive electronic circuits. And in particular, they're going to talk about three fundamental things. Uh, the first is a capacitor, and this is essentially like your, your battery, right? This is the thing that can store some charge and you can have it released, right? And this was actually invented or discovered way back in 1745, I think, in, in England, uh, was when they figured out you could have this kind of device. The next thing you have is a resistor, and that came about in 1827, and this is basically, again, a, the thing in your circuit that you can allow you to modify or change the, the current of, 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 the, of, the, of the voltage going across the wire 
uh, based on what the resistance is you set in, in, the, in this thing. Then soon after that, they came out with the inductor. And this is basically like you know, heating coils. Right? You can allow the, the circuit to convert the current into to heat or to energy outside the circuit. So for 150 years, this is pretty much all we, we had. right? And what happened was in 1971, there was a new professor at Berkeley in electrical engineering named Leon Chua. And he wrote this paper where he did the math and he predicted there was actually a fourth fundamental element of circuits that has yet to be discovered. So basically what happened is he worked out the math and he saw that like, you know, the way the equations worked out is that you had to have this fourth element. Um, and you couldn't build it from the other three fundamental elements, so it had to be sort of a low-level primitive in itself. So essentially what he predicted is that it was going to be a two-terminal device, so the input and an output, where you can change the resistance uh, of the device based on what voltage you apply to it, right? So, you, so think of it like a resistor, but you can modify what its resistance is based on what, what other current you give into it. But then the key thing is about it is that what happens is if you turn off this voltage you're using to set the resistance, the device will, will remember or persist what that resistance was forever. Right? So think of like a res think of like resistor, you have a little knob, you, you, can, you can change it, uh, and it, but it doesn't require you to have power all the time in order to, to make that knob stick. So he wrote this paper in 1971, and it was very theoretical, very mathematical, and no one ever read it, right? Because no one could understand it. Uh, and so then what happened was, pretty, you know, no one knew about this. So then, in the 2000s, uh, so, so sorry, what he's essentially predicting is what we call now the memristor. So the memristor is going to be the fourth element of, of all the fundamental circuits. So again, this paper came out, no one read it, and no one really knew about it. And then in the early 2000s, there was a team at HP Labs led by Stanley Williams that was trying to you know, do some far-reaching research and developing sort of low-level nano-computing nano devices that were like self-assembling. And what happened was they created this nano device that had this, these weird electrical properties that they couldn't actually really understand. They didn't know why it was sort of behaving the way it would behave. Right? You would put a voltage in and you would expect to get one voltage out, but you would get something else. Right? And they sort of had this thing for a couple years and they didn't really understand why it was doing this thing and what was actually going on. And then they just happened to stumble upon, uh, a few years later, Chua's 1971 paper and then they finally realized what they had invented was the memristor, right? Which is, is pretty crazy. And so th they had this big announcement in 2008 saying that we, this, we found this, this, this last fourth circuit and we, we can actually manufacture it. And so just to be clear, uh, I have a link here to, the, to the, the, the Stanley Williams HP page. And make sure you get the right one. Right? There's two Stanley Williams. Back in when we started this project, I had Joy try to reach out to this guy and, and talk to him. Uh, Joy ended up contacting this guy. Uh, this is a death row inmate in, in LA who's actually the, one of the founders of the West Side Crips. So you don't want this one. This is the real Stanley Williams, right? Um, just, so when you Google Stanley Williams, make sure you get the, that one. So uh, what was really kind of cool about the memristor stuff is when they announced that, that they discovered it, uh, they actually went back into like the, the old journals and annals of scientific publications of the last century, and they kept finding examples of other memristors. So this graph here is sort of a sort of a um, uh, sort of ideal case or a simulation of what a memristor would actually do on the circuit, right? You change you change the current, you change the voltage, and it changes what the resistance is. And you change the current. So you see this thing called a hysteresis loop, right? And so what they did is they went back to all these old publications and they found examples of people basically drawing the same kind of hysteresis loop that would have the same properties when they were doing other kind of experiments, but they didn't know what it was, right? They didn't know about the memristor yet. They didn't know why it was doing these things. It was just having this unusual property and there's all these papers that sort of show this, this, the, these examples. So this one is testing out different uh, metal alloys inside of a vacuum circuits. There's even papers from the 1920s, 1930s, again, where they, they chart this kind of uh, loop and they, don't, they say, we don't know why it does this. Here's just something interesting we found, right? But in fact, they were, they were inventing memristors, but they didn't know what it was at the time. Um, so there's this paper here, two centuries of memristors. Uh, the other one, too, about you know, reading how the, the HP guys found it. I absolutely encourage you to read that. I think it's absolutely fascinating what they were doing. Um, 
And we'll talk a little bit why uh, I totally drank the Kool-Aid about member are going to save the world. Uh, that was back in 2008, 2009, and now we're 2016, and, and it's still, still not here yet. But we'll talk about that later. So, so here's the sort of another thing that makes it kind of tricky about understanding this sort of non-volatile memory technology. So HP invented this, this memristor and announced that they had found it, but the memristor is not one particular type of technology, right? It's sort of this class of, of circuits, a class of storage technologies. So I'm gonna go through the three major, major emerging technologies that are gonna come out for non-volatile memory, and all of these are classified, can be classified as memristors, even though the resistant RAM one is the one from HP, and that's what they're marketing as the memristor, right? So they're all memristors, but HP markets memristor for their device. But, but they, you can also think of it as resistive RAM. So what was sort of touted as going to be one of the first, uh, one of these first storage devices to come out, uh, the main technology, was uh, this stuff called phase change memory. And the basic idea of the way it works is that you have sort of two electric, uh, uh, metal electrodes at the top and the bottom here, and then you have this calx calxogenide here that can be, can, you, you, you can modify its state to be either like a zero or one, right, its resistance on the wire, uh, based on what form it's in. And you can change its form to be sort of opaque or transparent if you heat it up, right? So what happens is if you want to set this to a zero, then you give it a, the heater is this line going into it, you give it a quick burst of energy, and then that'll reset it to zero. But then if you give it a, a, a gradual increase of energy, that will change it into, its structure to become a one, right? And so it's obviously not really like, you know, it's not a little flame in there, it's just a little wire that gives, gives us a little shock of energy. Um, so, one of the, so this was sort of believed to be one of the first non multi member devices that were gonna come out, but this sort of has, about, as you can imagine, a bunch of manufacturing and heating problems because you know, you have to use a lot of energy to, to change this device. So we're not really gonna talk about the form factors of, the, of these, these storage technologies, but one of the things that's gonna happen in the future is they're gonna start moving more and more storage, more memory directly on the CPUs, right? It's gonna kind of 3D stacking on top of it because you wanna reduce the latency of having to go out the memory controller. And so in the case of PCM and certainly DRAM, you can't put these things directly on the device because it just uses too much energy. It's gonna to generate too much heat and fry, and fry the CPU. So this thing, again, IBM was pushing this. Uh, Intel gave, uh, was giving overtures that this is what they were gonna do. Um, but no one's, I think you can get like 128 megabytes of this now, uh, but it really hasn't, you know, they haven't really ramped up manufacturing. You can't get this in large quantities yet. The, the next one that I find the most interesting is the resistant RAM. And again, this is what HP calls their memristors. And the basic idea way this works is that you have two layers of platinum or some metal, and then you have a titanium dioxide layers in between. And so it's actually two layers of titanium dioxide where the bottom layer has all the, elect all the electrons it's supposed to have, and, th and then this upper layer is missing a few of them. And then based on what, kind of, uh, what direction the current you put in it, some electrons move up and down, and that changes the resistive properties of, of the circuit up, up above. So you run circuits in one, you run the, direct, the current one way, electrons go down, you get a zero, run another way, electrons go up and you get a one, right? It's the basic idea how it works. And what's really awesome about this, and again, why I think the memristor stuff, when, it, when the story came out, this was amazing. Titanium dioxide is the same crap they put in white house paint, right? Or it's the same thing they put in like sunscreen. So it's super common, it's super cheap. Uh, so you can be able to, you know, and they were talking about they can make, you know, these memristors to be, one petabyte per square centimeter. Some crazy numbers, right? And of course that hasn't happened yet because they were having troubles manufacturing this. The another really thing that's really awesome about uh, memristors, if you believe what HP people say, uh, and again, if you, if you read sort of like this article here, how we found the missing memristor, and the, watch the video from Stanley Williams, the right one. Uh, they talk about how you can actually turn the storage fabric itself into program, programmable execution logic or ex executable gates. So you can think of it as like, you can turn half of your, your DRAM into an actual FPGA, and you can program it into compute whatever computations you want directly on data that's on the same storage device, right? So they talk about how like, yeah, this is like, we can build neural networks on this thing, and we can basically simulate the brain uh, at, you know, well beyond what we can do today, all directly in memristors, right? And of course now when like HP announces their, their big memristor machine called The Machine, they don't talk about this part. You know, I haven't really seen too much literature about this, right? They're all about just having non-volatile non storage. 
but if this happens, this, I think this would be amazing. And what's also really cool about it too, it doesn't use the same sort of NAND executable logic gates uh, that our CMOS chips use today. It actually uses a different type of logic called material implication logic that was invented by Bertrand Russell, uh, who's like a famous philosopher and, and like an awesome dude from like 1910. So you're using like 1910 mathematics to program, you know, 21st century uh, memristors. I think that's amazing. Um, of course, now, again, HP says that they're going to put this in, the, in their new thing called the machine. But I think it was about a year ago they announced that the first versions of the machine aren't going to have any of this memristor stuff. It's just going to have regular DRAM. So who knows when, when this will happen. And then the last one that's much farther out than PCM or resistive RAM is the magneto resistive RAM. Um, and this is actually not a, old, a new idea. It's been around since the 1990s. But they have a new technology called spin transfer torque uh, MRAM or STT MRAM that is supposedly going to be how they're going to be able to implement this in the, in, the, in the future and get really good scale beyond what PCM or, or uh, resistor RAM can do. And the basically way it works is that you have uh, basically two magnets, right? So these ferromagnetic materials, you have one at the top that's fixed, meaning its polarity is always going in one direction. And then you have one at the bottom where you can switch it, right? If you send a little current in, you can switch its polarity back and forth, and then that gives you the zero and one. And so what they claim is that this SCT RAM, well, you'd be able to scale it to be much smaller uh, sizes than what you can do with PCM and, and the SRAM, or the um, resistor RAM stuff. And they also claim that it'll have latencies that are closer to SRAM, right, your L1, L2, L3 cache, uh, instead of DRAM. So it would be like you'd get rid of maybe L3 and get rid of DRAM entirely, and you can have your entire system built out, out of this stuff. Um, as far as I know, this is, this is way farther out. This is like maybe 10, 15, 20 years, right? Who's they here? Who's they? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a, there's a couple of like smart, smaller startups are doing this. I don't know whether the big companies have anything. I think Samsung, Yeah, I think they all have little labs. But they don't really publish exactly what they're doing. Um, yeah, I think he's right. Samsung is, is one, of the, one of the major ones looking at this. OK. So again, this is just sort of a high level overview of what the, the technology looks like and how it actually works. Um, nope, sorry. And basically, what's going to happen in the future is uh, Intel announced that in, they'll have their new 3D cross point, which I I shouldn't say anything, we're on video, uh, which is an OK name. Uh, they announced that they're going to have the NVMe 3D crosspoint drives, like the PCI Express drives, later in 2016. Um, and then through our various travels, we've heard rumors that in 2017, they will update the Xeon uh, instruction set to now include the ability to deal with NVM DIMMs. And I'll see, we'll sh see in a second what you have to do to make sure that you can, make, that you can do writes in memory to be, end up being durable. So these new, these new instructions will end up in the 2017 17 update. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll have NVM DIMMs available right away. It just means that the CPU will be able to handle it when they finally come out. Come out. Uh, Samsung has announced in uh, last year, in 2015, that they, have a, they partnered with this, this other company called Netist. And they're looking to develop their MV, MV DIM P storage technology. So they're not saying which of the you know, three you know, device or, or technologies, PCM, uh, RERAM, or the magnetic stuff. They're not, they don't say what they're exactly doing. They're just looking in this area now. So they have sort of MV DIMs that are basically DRAM backed by flash. Um, uh, but they, to have a truly NVM, you know, all NVM only storage technology, uh, they haven't announced anything yet. And in the case of HP's Memristor or RERAM, it's always two years away. In 2008, Stanley Williams came out and says, oh yeah, by 2010 we'll have it. 2010 was always two years. 2014 was two years. Now 2016, they're saying two, two more years, right? Uh, just to give you an idea to show you that I'm not kidding. This is, a, this is a photo somebody took from the HP Labs, uh, a big announcement, I think, in 2010. And here they're talking 2008, yeah, they're, they're going to have they're gonna have their thing ready. And then they say it's going to be two years later, we'll, we'll be able to run um, memristors. And it hasn't happened, right? It's always, it's always two years for these guys. Um, so we'll see. OK. So uh, how does this all, how does this all, how is this going to affect our database system? So as I said, the first devices that are going to come out are going to be these NVMe storage cards on PCI Express, and they're going to be block addressable. 
And from our thinking it through, we suspect that the block adjustable NVM will be not that interesting for database systems, right? They're essentially just going to be faster SSDs. Uh, Joy is looking at it in do some, doing some research on how to maybe improve logging still when you have a block addressable device, but it's not going to be a, a, a it's just going to be an extension of possibly what, what already has been done. There's not going to be really fundamental changes. It's when we have the byte addressable non-volatile memory, is that when, that's when we think things are going to be dramatically different. And that's going to be a big game changer for database system architectures. Uh, but it's going to make we have to make sure that we're going to end up using we have to use MVM correctly, and as we'll see what I mean, that, well, I'll, we'll, we'll show you what I mean by that in a second. And so it is my uh, it's my hunch that when this byte addressable stuff comes out, the in-memory database systems, the kind that we've been talking about in this class, they will be better positioned to use MVM correctly and efficiently uh, when it's byte addressable, more so than the disk-oriented guys, right? And the disk-oriented systems they assume that memory is volatile, and they have, they have a block-based storage device that can put, all the, the, put their slide of pages down, and they'll, main, they'll have to maintain this buffer pool to pull things in and out. But now you have this problem of, uh, I'm writing into my, my, my buffer pool, I'm writing to a slot in my buffer pool, that can be made durable, but the database system is not going to treat that as a durable write. It's still going to have to do the mechanism to write it to a log and write it out to, to disk later on. Right, so it's not it's it, the systems are not going to be able to be no, or it cannot be changed very easily to deal with non-volatile memory and use it correctly. Whereas the in-memory systems, because we're already dealing with pointers and other things, as long as we make sure those pointers are, are consistent on restart, then we'll get the better performance. And I'll say some things offline about what I've heard from uh, from commercial systems about this. And then the other thing that would be is, that is important to consider also too is is my intuition that non-volatile memory, the byte addressable non-volatile memory stuff, will be only have a major impact for all the to be applications, all the to be workloads. Right? We saw last class when we talked about larger than memory databases. For OLAP, there's not that much, you, not much you can do because you're just streaming things off of, uh, you know, of durable storage, and you really can't take advantage of any aspect of the actual workload itself. So in the same ways, in an OLAP system, I suspect that these systems will just, just get faster. But you don't really fundamentally change the architecture. Yes. So uh, the fact that for OLPP, it's uh, the byte addressable uh, NVM matters a lot. Uh, have you uh, considered that you can just battery back a DRAM, and that's going to basically give you? I mean, what's the trade-off? Yeah. So, so, so his statement is, um, what if you just had battery backed up DRAM? Right? So you, you can buy DRAM now today that has a supercapacitor on it so that when, the, when power is, is cut, that the system has enough juice to write it out to, to like flash. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So this idea of battery backed up DRAM in database systems is not new. There's papers going back to like 1988, 1989 that do this. Um, the, for this particular paper we talked about here, uh, well, I'll show you what, what the things you have to do to make sure that still works, right? But you have to, again, the, one of the things that you couldn't do back in the 80s, we can do now, or at least when the Xeon gets updated, is make sure that when we write to a CPU cache that we can flush it out to, to storage, right? Because the issue is, yes, your battery, you have battery backed up DRAM, but then you come back online and, like, what the hell are you looking at, right? Um, and I'll also say, too, that, like, we're not going to be able to do this magic thing where like you pull the plug and then you plug it back in and it's exactly as the way it was before, right? Because there's all the low level registers, there's just uh, the program counters and things like that. All that gets blown away. It's just that we do not have to pay this big penalty to like replay the log and, and load in snapshots as before. So again, it's, I think the byte addressable stuff is going to be more significant for LTP because that's where we're actually doing writes, right? And that's where like having persistent memory can make a big difference. Um, did I lose this? OK. All right, so this sort of leads into the paper that you guys are, you are assigned to read. And again, this is a paper that Joy and I wrote last, last year um, that was published in, in Sigmod. And our basic goal for this was to try to understand how a database system would behave or, or interact with MVM in a system that only has MVM. So this is sort of me as a new professor trying to be very forward thinking. And this is like saying, we're 10 years from now, if DRAM goes away uh, and you only had NVM, regardless of what technology it's actually using, how would you actually want to design and, and, and your database system to, to use it correctly? 
And we focus on the storage recovery methods because that's where the uh, that's sort of where the main bottleneck, the main slowdown is going to be uh, for storage, right? If everything's in memory and you don't care about persistence, there's not much, you, you know, there's not anything different with MVM versus DRAM. But when you have MVM and you can be a bit smarter about it, we think we can speed those things up. So to do this, uh, we developed a prototype database system called NStore uh, that was sort of a stripped down uh, database test bed that had a, stor a pluggable storage architecture that's going to allow us to implement a, a bunch of different engines in a single system and not worry about the high level features of like the SQL parser or, or transactions and just focus on measuring what the performance is of, of the storage and recovery mechanism mechanisms in, in the system. So before we get to what these, store these database sort of storage engines are, we need to talk about what we need in our system uh, in, our, in our execution environment to be able to use MVM correctly and ensure that we have dur uh, durability. And so the first issue we have to deal with is uh, the, s the synchronization of, of our writes to memory. So as I said, all the existing program models, like if, is all, they're all based on the von Neumann architecture, right? So you have this, this DRAM that's, that's ephemeral, that's transient, that's volatile. You do all writes there. And then if you want to make sure that anything's persistent, you then have to write it out to to, uh, to, to, to disk. But now, if we have uh, non-volatile memory, we can do any write into memory, and we want to make sure that's, that's, that's guaranteed, that's, that's durable. But the problem is there's this CPU, there's CPU has caches in between you know, the MVM device and in our process where we're doing the writes, and the CPU can decide at any time that it wants to move things out to MVM. Or we also need to make sure that if we do a write and, and, and we, our transaction commits, we want to flush out those changes to MVM and not have them sitting in our CPU cache. Right? So sort of like this. I do my store into L1, L2. And before I can tell the application that their transaction committed, I want to make sure that it's out and safe and durable in the MVM. So our, we're going to need some way to, to ensure this in, in, our, in our system. And right now, operating systems like Linux and whatnot do not provide this. So we're going to have to develop our own memory allocator. The other problem we have is we need the ability to restart the, our process and make sure that all our, when we, when we start looking at our, our memory, our table heap and, and, and data structures for our database system, we want to make sure that they're pointing to Valid, valid pieces of data, right? Because we, we start a program and we, we, and the first time we're using virtual memory addresses to point to different things. Now we crash and come back and we can restore the state of our application because uh, it's already in MVM. Uh, we want to make sure that all our indexes are pointing to the correct things. And likewise, if we're using some, something like MVCC, if we have multiple versions where we embed pointers in the actual tuples themselves, we want to make sure that they're also pointing to valid things, right? So when the thing crashes, what we want to be able to do is come back and just restore all of this in some kind of smart way. So we need a way to be able to identify that like, this is some offset, this is some location in memory, and that's what we're pointing to. So when we, in, regardless of where it is in physical memory, the virtual memory addresses are all, 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 all still the same. So to make this work, we had to develop our own uh, MVMware memory allocator. And so you can think of this as a replacement for, for like malloc. And it's going to provide these two basic primitives. The first primitive is a sort of a synchronization function that exposes a sort of function call like msync or fsync to the application that forces the allocator to write back any cache line in, 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 in the CPU to out to MVM. And you use this new instruction that Intel added recently called CL flush or cache line flush. And then you issue a, an sfence instruction to have the database process wait until the CPU comes back and says, yes, that this, this data you, in this cache line is now durable in MVM. And then the second thing we're going to provide is uh, a naming uh, primitive that allows us to assign uh, virtual memory addresses to, uh, to, with a marker so that when we come back online and we have that same marker, we get the same, same data regardless of where it is in physical memory. Right? So this is sort of going beyond what you know, malloc provides you today, we have to extend this because we want to make sure we're using MVM correctly. Yes? So when you say, uh, regardless of where it is in the physical memory, the physical memory is not changing, right? That's the so, yeah, sorry, the, the, the virtual memory, right? Yes, because your, your process starts up, and it can be anywhere in virtual memory. Yes, the physical memory is always going to be the same. And the pointer is 
going to have a virtual memory address. Correct, yes. So why do you want the virtual memory address to stay the same? You want, uh, you want the mapping to stay the same, right? From yeah, yeah so you want the virtual address mapping. Like, you, you, you give it a logical name, and it knows that I saw that logical name before. Yes, yeah, so I, I should back up. To do this, the allocator is maintaining some metadata internally yeah. to keep track of this mapping, right? And so when you come back, come back, it has to restore this, this metadata. And we have to do all the same things to make sure the metadata is, is persistent and durable and atomic in our, in our allocator when it writes it out to MVM. So when our process starts back up, we know that we were this process before, and here's, here's the metadata for our process, and then here's how to map the markers to the, the virtual memory addresses. So everything comes back exactly the way it was before. And we can use this primitive to now build sort of more complicated data structures on top of this, like linked lists and B trees and things like that. Uh, so that again, when, when we crash and we start, all the pointers are pointing to the valid thing. All right? Yes? Yeah, so but the page table is all stored in MVRAM, so that indicates that the page table won't be changed after it restarts. So the sta statement is the page table is stored in MVRAM, so that for means that the page table will be the same after restart. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so now if we have this, these primitives, we can now build our database engines. So for this, for this uh, paper, we built the three sort of canonical engines you would have in, in a real system today. So the first one is to support in-place updates, and this is essentially what we've been talking about uh, so far, uh, where you have a table heap with tuples, and then anytime you want to modify something in the table heap, you just overwrite the existing tuple. Right, we're not doing MVCC. Um, and then we also update a write-ahead log for the delta that changed, and then it periodically we'll take snapshots and write them out to durable storage as well. So this is essentially the same architecture that's used in HStore or VoltDB. The, uh, the second one is a copy and write architecture, and this is where you don't have a log at all. You only have the table heap, and the table heap is being organized as a B tree or B plus tree, and we'll use sort of essentially shadow paging to make additional copies of the nodes in the B tree and when a transaction commits, we just flip a little pointer to now point to the new version. And I'll show what, that, show what that looks like in a second. But the key thing about this one, it doesn't have a write-ahead log. And this is exemplified by the LMDB system. And the last one is the log structured architecture where we don't have a table heap, we only have a write-ahead log, and all changes get appended to them. We're using the same kind of leveled architecture that's used in LevelDB or RocksDB for this. So I'm going to go through each of these engines one by one, and then I'll show you how you can modify and improve them to use the, our MVM aware allocator to get better performance and have uh, and reduce the wear down on the device. So in the case of the in-place updates engine, as I said, you have an in-memory index, you have an in-memory table heap, and then you have an durable storage, you have a write-ahead log and, and snapshots. So say we want to modify this tuple here. The first write we're going to have to do is write the delta to the write-ahead log. Uh, the second write would be the, the change to the actual tuple itself, and then eventually later on, the database system will, will make a third write out to write the snapshot of the updated tuple. And so if you think about this, again, in, in, in the context of an MVM system, we don't have any more DRAM. Everything's in MVM, right? So if we persist our change here, we don't really need it, the, the write-ahead log, potentially, right? And we potentially also don't need the, the snapshot. Because if this, as long as this is durable, our change is there, right? So the first problem is we have duplicate data. And then we also have a, a, a longer recovery latency because we have to follow that same protocol before where we replay the snapshots or load the last snapshot in and then replay the log. So we're, all this duplicate data is unnecessary if we're careful about how we do our writes into the table heap. So to optimize this architecture, we're going to leverage the allocator's non-volatile memory pointers uh, to only record what items were changed rather than how they were changed. So meaning I don't need to store deltas anymore, I just need to store a, a, a pointer to say, here's the thing that got modified. And at this point, when it's flushed to the log, I know that my change is, is persistent and durable. And so we're only going to have to maintain a, an ephemeral or transient undo log, because we need to be able to roll back a transaction if, uh, if, if, you know, if it aborts. And the reason why we have to do this is because the CPU cache, the CPU is allowed to flush anything out of its cache at once, so it may be the case that although our transaction has committed yet, things moved out of L1, L2, L3 out into our MVM device, and so if we need to roll back the transaction, we need to be able to know that this thing didn't actually commit, and we need to reverse its changes. And likewise, if we crash after 
you know, before the transaction was aborted or committed, and we want to be able to roll it back and know that in our MVM, this, this change actually should, should have, have not been made. So it looks sort of like this. So now everything's in MVM. Uh, and when we want to modify this tuple, we only need to store our, in our write ahead log a pointer to this tuple to say this is the thing that got modified. And then we can write our change directly to here. And only then, when this thing is actually made in place and we know it's durable, then our transaction is safe to commit. Now, if we crash before we um, if we crash before we get to demod or crash before the transaction commits to get, get modify this, we have that undo log in MVM to go ahead and reverse it. But if we crash after this transaction committed, then the, the memory allocator, the, the library, just goes and checks to make sure that the pointers are all valid and can reverse anything that shouldn't have, shouldn't have been there yet. Right, so when, when we commit, we not only commit to the right-hand log, we also commit to the memory allocator. Yes? So on, on a very high level, the, the architecture is very similar to what we had earlier. And we, uh, like, cache is now DRAM. Uh, yes. So, so, so your comment is that the cache, the CPU cache is essentially the, the volatile DRAM. Yeah. Yes. And uh, in the DRAM disk case, it was, uh, it was found that doing the right-hand log and then flushing data afterwards is better. And here you're saying that uh, we can we flush it right away. Yes. Because the cache is much smaller than DRAM. Uh, DRAM was in case of DRAM disk. So his, his question is, are we flushing before the transaction commits instead of after? Oh, sorry, we're flushing, we're flushing our write before the transaction commits rather than after because the CPU caches are smaller? No, not before. Like when it commits, yes. you're flushing it to, uh, to NVM, yes. which is the equivalent of flushing from DRAM to disk in the earlier case. Correct, yes. And earlier it was not done so that you could amortize the cost of writing to disk. And, yes. Um, so now you're saying that we don't need that. Correct. Is it because? Uh, the latency is much lower, or because the L2, L3 cache size is much smaller than you can't Yeah, it's because the latency is, is slower, uh, the latency is lower, and that we don't have, like in DRAM, it's because we don't have complete control of how things get moved from CPU caches to, to, to MVM. Like in DRAM to disk, we have complete control of moving those blocks, right? Now, in our case, we can be sure, we can call CL flush, we can be sure that we've, we've moved things out to MVM. But as I said, this, the CPU is allowed to move stuff down anytime it wants as well. Right? So it's because it's faster, we, we can do that. And because we want to make sure it's really there, we can do that ahead of time too. So in, in future, would it make sense that DBMSs would, should take control of the cache as well as the MVM? Like, so how it, they take control of RAM and so his statement is, is should in the future the, the, uh, should the database system take complete control of the, arch of the, the, the hardware's caches? Uh, they're adding, I mean, they, they slowly add more and more instructions that expose different functionalities, like prefetching with the CL flush stuff. Uh, in many cases, though, the hardware stuff is pretty good. We didn't talk about prefetching, but prefetching it, it usually does much better than software. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to the question. But whatever they expose to us, we'll try it. All right? OK. All right, so for the copy and write engine, again, you can sort of think of this as like shadow paging um, from your intro class. Right? You have a master record at the top that points to some current directory pointer. And then you have some kind of tree structure where you have leaf nodes. And then these leaves point to slotted pages where you have a bunch of tuples packed in. Um, so now if I want to update a tuple that's in slotted page 0, a co the copyright engine will first make a copy of the update of this leaf here and, and the entire page and just modify the one thing that it needed. So if there's multiple tuples in here, you copy the whole thing. Uh, and then you create a new dirty directory. And in this case here, leaf 2 hasn't been changed. So both the, old, the, the current directory and the new dirty directory can point to it. And then once we know all the changes by the transaction are done, then we go up update the master record pointer to now point to our, our new thing. And then we can do garbage collection and blow away all the stuff that's not accessible by the master record. Right? Um, the problem with this, first, obviously, it, it's very copy to do, it's very expensive to do these copies for this data because although I wanted to update only one tuple, because I'm still based on the sort of block architecture of, 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 of SSDs and HDDs, I have to copy this whole slot of page over. Right, so that's very expensive to do. 
Uh, so in an MVM optimized version, instead of having slotted pages, we can have this thing just have, just have pointers to tuples, because everything is going to be NVM. So now when we update uh, this one tuple here, we can apply the changes and only have to copy the pointers to things in our updated leaf. Right? We don't have to copy the whole slotted page. And then we can do all the same stuff that we had before of, of updating, uh, creating a new dirty directory and then updating the master record to point to it. You still have to do garbage collection. You still have to do uh, all the other internal maintenance stuff to make this thing work. Um, but the key thing is that here we only have to, we, we're copying less data. Right? And we'll see in a second, you don't get that, you don't get that much improvement for using uh, copy and write um, architecture when using MVM. And you know, other than LMDB, I don't know if any system actually works like this because it has a lot of overhead. All right, this is sort of the approach that system R used in the early days and they abandoned it because it was, just, it was really slow. And I would say that when we first started this project, uh, Joy and I actually tried to make this one work because the idea was we were to take you know, 1970s technology and use our 1970s database concepts and use it on 21st century storage technology and it would magically you know, be awesome and just work. It didn't turn out to be the case at all. All right, so the last one is the log structured engine. And the, the canonical architecture from like LevelDB or RocksDB is that you have a mem table in memory, and this usually has a B plus tree that then points to things down in the right-head log. And then you have an SS table that's out on disk that has a bloom filter on top that will tell you whether a key's in there or not. And then you have an index that points to uh, the delts below. So if, I, if I'm going to do a write to a tuple, I uh, update <coughs> my right-head log, append a new tu tuple delta. And then eventually, over time, this will get full, and I'll create an SS table where I have tuple deltas and compacted tuple datas in here as well. So if, again, for one modification to a single tuple, it may get written multiple, multiple times because you're copying from SS tables to mem tables, or sorry, mem tables to S tables, you're combining SS tables, you're compacting things, right? So there's a lot, a lot of writes, but, and it's unnecessary because our mem table will be able to fit entirely in memory and MVM, so all our changes here are, are persistent. And we don't actually need this thing at all. all right? So we can cut down on duplicate data if we get rid of the SS table. And we don't have to worry about compactions anymore because everything is nice and in here. And so to do the MVM optimized, you'd basically this goes away. And you, now you only have the mem table in MVM. All right? All right, so just to summarize what, what we've done is we're going to leverage the byte addressability and the durability of, of MVM when we treat it as, as a persistent memory, to avoid unnecessary duplication. And this is going to have two effects. One, this is going to reduce, you know, improve our throughput because we're copying less data now. But it's also going to reduce the wear down on the device because now you're, you're, you're doing less writes. Right? These new MVM stuff, it's going to be like an SSD where you only have a certain number of writes before a cell burns out. It's going to be much higher, uh, dur uh, higher endurance than SSDs, but it's still going to be finite. So reducing the number of writes will, reduce the, the, will increase the lifetime of, of the device itself. And then for recovery, in many cases now because we only have these pointers and we, our memory allocator can look at its metadata and its page table, make sure that everything's all consistent when it comes back up, we don't have to replay a log and we don't have to spend a lot of time loading back in snapshots and checkpoints. Right? We can come back, do a quick check to make sure our pointers are valid, maybe roll back anything that, that shouldn't have been uh, written out to MVM, and we're good to go. And that's much faster to do than these traditional architectures. So for our evaluation, again, we're going to use the NStore testbed system that we developed. And again, to avoid the overhead of transactions and other things, we're going to use the HStore style concurrency control, where we have single-threaded engines that are protected by a lock, and a transaction can only execute once it acquires the lock. And it runs without contention from anybody else. So there's no, any lo there's no, level, no low level latches protecting any data structures. Yes? Yes. So do you keep moving them around physical memory so that you, because it's going to be very heavy, moving them around physical memory so that you distribute the data? Uh, so his question is, um, do we do anything in our, in our internally in our architecture to move data structures around to avoid the having to do a bunch of writes over and over again to the same cell and wear out the device? The answer is no. So we, we punt on this. We say that either. This is something the operating system can provide, or in the same way that the flash guys provide on, on the actual the ASICs on the cards themselves, we assume that 
some, someone else is going to take care of this. Whether it's hardware or the operating system, we don't care. We're just writing and letting, letting the device do whatever it wants to do. But yeah, absolutely, in, in the future, you can imagine if you're just writing, if, you're, you know, if you have a counter that's in MVM and you're updating it you know, a million times a second over and over again, it's one location, you'll burn out that cell pretty quickly. Yes? The statement is the copy and write stuff kind of does that for you. Yes. Well, it depends on how you, you implement your allocator buffer. Like if you're just using, if you're just reusing pages over and over again, you, you could burn it out. Or in the case of the in-place update, if you have one tuple and you're just always updating that one thing over and over again, you'd burn it out too. But again, we, we're, we're assuming someone else is going to fix that problem. Which is nice about databases. We're assuming that you, know, you punt it down the road. All right. So, as I said, you can't actually buy NVM today, at least not in the, in the, in the, the byte addressable DIM format stuff. Um, so, for this paper, we're using an experimental NVM hardware emulator that was developed by, by Intel Labs. And the, basically, the way it works, everything's still just DRAM, but they go into the debug hooks for the memory controller and they add uh, busy loops so that when you read and write to memory, it spins for a little bit and slows down the latency to be just you know, as if it was actually in MVM. Um, so, and it's really kind of cool because you can go in the BIOS or a kernel settings and you can change what the latency is you want for these devices. So for, for these experiments that I'm showing here, it would be 2x the speed of, of DRAM, but I think we can go up to 8x uh, in, in the emulator. And depending on who you talk to, the range is going to be about 4 to 6x uh, slower than DRAM. And for this experiment, we're using YCSB. Uh, but we're using a write-heavy workload with 10% reads and 9% writes because again, we want to stress the actual device itself and see how well our architectures perform. And then we have a high skew getting where it's a, there's a hotspot in the system where all the transactions are trying to update the same thing. Now, we don't have contention issues from, from transactions because we have a single-threaded engine, so you know, every transaction can run without having to try to acquire a lock on the actual tuple. Right? So this is sort of almost running at bare metal speed for all our transactions, which is what we wanted to do. All right, so in the first experiment, what we're going to do is just measure what the runtime performance or the throughput we get from these different architectures. So the gray bars represent the sort of traditional implementations of these, 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 these architectures. Like if you take an intro database course, it's essentially exactly how you would see in a textbook. And then the other bars correspond to the optim MVM optimized versions of, of, of them. So this is, again, the gray bars are assuming that memory is volatile and they're not taking advantage of it, whereas the, the red bars are assuming that, that memory is non-volatile if you use it correctly. And so across the board, what you see is that the MVM uh, implementations, MVM aware implementations, get much better throughput. In this case here, it's, it's over almost 2x uh, better. Um, the copy and write one is, is always the slowest. Uh, followed by the log structured one, um, and this is not really surprising because this, this is what you would see, you know, in in you know disk based system even today. You would see the same kind of numbers, but we also can measure and also in in the system the number of writes we're doing again because we want to measure how how well are we uh, how often are we doing writes and therefore how long would the device actually last, right? So in this case here, lower is better. So we see in place updates are doing much fewer writes. Than, than, uh, than all the other ones. And the copy or write one, obviously, is, is the most expensive because for every single update, you're copying a, you know, a large slice of the tree over and over again. So we see a reduction in about 40% for in-place, 25% for copy and write, and 20% for log structured. So again, this is showing you that if you treat MVM as truly persistent memory in your database system architecture, you'll get, you know, you'll, it, it'll, the device will last longer. And then in this last experiment, we can measure how long it takes to recover the system after a crash. So the first thing, obviously, there's a giant space missing here for the copy and write engine because it has no, it has no recovery policy at all, right? Because if you crash before a transaction finishes, the master record pointer never got, never got switched, so you're still pointing to the current directory, and therefore it's consistent. So there's nothing to roll back, right? So that's why there's, there's no numbers here. Now, in the case of the... Uh, in-place updates engine and the log structure engines, what you see is this, this stepping function going up, where as you increase the number of transactions you have to recover after a crash, so these are the number of transactions in your log that you have to replay, obviously you increase the, the recovery time because there's more transactions to recover, there's more, more computational overhead. But for the MVM optimized ones, it's nearly flat because the only thing we have to do when we come back is just to make sure that 
all our pointers are, are still correct. And it doesn't matter that, you know, how many transactions in the log. We may have to roll back the last couple ones, but it can be done really quickly. Right, so again, this is showing you that not only do you reduce the number of writes and get better throughput when you, when you run the system at runtime, when it comes time to recover the system, you can almost get instantaneous recovery. Right, now, obviously, if you increase the size of the database, th th this will go up. Um, but in the terms of number of transactions we have in, in the log, it doesn't really affect it. All right, so the, the main takeaway I want you to get from this lecture is that when MVM comes along, there are things we're going to have to do to make sure that our database system is, is using it correctly in order to get the best performance of it. I think that MVM is going to be a, uh, will have a big impact on the design of software systems when they come out. Um, the, and people are going to scramble to try to figure out how to update their existing architecture, or existing implementations to use it correctly. And as I said, I think the M memory guys are going to be better positioned because it's not going to be a major rewrite to, you know, to have to pull out the buffer pool manager and all this other legacy code in order to use MVM correctly. We have to make sure we use maybe a smart memory allocator and make sure we're, we're syncing our, uh, our, our writes correctly. But a lot of the stuff we talked about in this class doesn't have to change. So I think that's kind of cool. So any questions about MVM? Any questions about the paper? Any questions about this? Okay. So in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I want to spend time talking about the code reviews. So again, as I mentioned before, uh, part of finishing up the class for project number three is that you are required, each group is required to give a code review to another group in the class. And the idea is that you want to look at their impl implementation of their project and provide them feedback on what they can do to improve their code, maybe fix some bugs, maybe, and ask questions about, you know, you know how, what's this thing actually doing? And the idea, and again, we want to get you ex experience in doing this because when you go out in the real world, it's not like you're write a bunch of code and throw it over the fence and then you're done with it, right? You're going to have to sit down with other people and look at your code and try to, you know, make sense of it and see how it fits into to the larger system. So the way we're going to do this is that each development group, each group that actually, you know, worked on a project was going to provide a pull request on GitHub to the group they've been assigned to review their code. And then the, the reviewing group will look at the code and provide com comments in that pull request and suggestions or ask questions or, or ask for clarifications on what the actual implementation does. Uh, and so, so we can keep track of all this. I'll send an email out as a reminder that uh, everyone should send me the URL for the pull request so that Joy and I can look at it and make sure that everyone's doing what they should be doing. So this is sort of part of your, your grade for project three is your participation in doing this, this pull request. And I'll provide a full write-up of some of the things I'm talking about today and other, you know, other, um, the, the protocol for how we're going to do this, and I'll post it on Piazza uh, la later in the week. So the due date for this will be May 8th at, at 12 p.m. So this is two days after the final project presentation and three days before the, the sort of the code drop. So it's sort of smack dab in the middle. And so I realize this is going to be kind of tough because not only do you have to provide your code available to, available to the group that's going to review it for you, but you also have to do, do the review for their code. So uh, that's why I'm sort of putting this right before the deadline, but after the, the final presentation is to give you enough time to sort of finish things up. And it sort of goes without saying that uh, you should try to be helpful and courteous. Don't be a dick in your, in your code review, right? As far as I know, nobody's here is actually graduating, right? So you're all going to be back in the fall. So if you're an asshole during this code review, you got to come back in the fall and see everyone again. So that's not going to be good. Are you graduating? Yeah. All right, so you can be a dick. <laughs> um, no, so again, like, and, uh, you know, again, this is meant to help you improve your coding. By seeing other people's code, seeing other ideas, and getting feedback on it, I think can help you help everyone improve, right? Yes? Is there a due date for when we have to send the forecast? No. Uh, oh, yeah, it probably just says it. Um, Let's say, let's say maybe May 6th, or maybe we can, we can pump this out to May 9th and maybe the, have the thing be May 7th, yeah. Right, you, you, send it, you send a pull request to their team and then they have two days to look at it. And then the, the on May 11th when you do the final code drop, that gives you two or three days to actually apply the, the you know, the, make the changes that they suggested. All right, again, I'll, I'll, I'll document this on Piazza, what, what, I, what I expect. But I wanna, what I want to do is sort of go through some general guidelines, some general tips about what you should be doing in, in, in your, uh, for your code review. 
So first, the, the team that write the code, the team that wrote the code should provide the reviewing team with sort of high level summary um, or an outline of what they should be looking at, right? If you, if you refactor some code or ran it through the formatter and just changed some, some minor things, you obviously, the code reviewing team doesn't want to look at that because it's a waste of time. So you want to provide a summary to say, here's the files or here's the functions you should, uh, we spend most of our time on, and this is what we want you to look, look at. So the general rule of thumb that I found online is that they recommend that you don't really review more than 400 lines or so at a time, and you only really spend 60 minutes of, at a time doing the code review, right? Uh, I don't know that that'll work out for this project, but we'll see how it goes. But the idea is that like you want to dedicate 60 minutes of un uninterrupted time to look at the code and, and, and figure out what's going on, rather than being distracted by other things. And when you start doing your code review, rather than just saying, hey, I'm just going to read a bunch of code, you should have an outline or, or a, a plan of what, you, what you're actually looking for and what suggestions you're going to try to provide, that, provide to, in, in your review. And so you want to use a checklist to provide what kind of problems you're going to look for. And I'll go through what, what those examples are in a second. So the checklist can be sort of broken up into three parts. The first is sort of the high level things about the code itself, right? Obviously, whether does the code work? Can you read it and understand it? Is Zeekly dropping down and doing assembly in the, in the project again? And, and you, nobody, can, nobody can understand what's going on. Uh, is there a lot of any redundant code or duplicate code? And this is a big deal. We want to avoid this. Did it look like they took one file, copied it, and renamed it to another location and made some minor changes? That's bad. We want to avoid that. Is the code going to be modular? Like it's not just one giant function or one giant file that does everything, right? Does it look like things can be broken up and reused? Uh, we want to avoid global variables as much as possible or if at all in our system. Obviously in Postgres, because it's written in C, they have global variables up the wazoo. But since Peloton code is in C++, we, we should be able to avoid this. Uh, are there any large segments of commented out code? Uh, if so, those should be removed. Right? If, you, if you wrote you know, a bunch of functions that you end up not needing, just delete them rather than leave them commented out. And then lastly, are they using the proper Peloton debug functions? Right? I think we have checks to make sure there's no printf or C out statements or, or C error. Uh, and you should be using the, sort of the, the, the debug info stuff that we provide you. Right? And that way, we don't, you know, we don't see these random writes to the standard out that's slowing down our system. We have to figure out where in the code they're actually located. Uh, the, the next category stuff is based on the documentation of the system. So it sort of goes without saying, but like, we want to make sure our code, our code is commented, it explains what's going on, right? And it's not trivial stuff like, here's a for loop, right? It actually explains the hard parts. Um, are all the functions commented? Um, if there's any edge cases or weird stuff that you had to handle or, you know, that, that you know, that's maybe sort of one-off or special case in the code, is that clearly documented? Um, if you're using any kind of third-party line or third-party libraries, uh, obviously, you know, I don't care. You don't have to document that I'm using an SDL vector. But if there's some other complicated library you're using in, in a special way, you should absolutely document what that actually is. And then lastly, very important, uh, is that if there's code that you know that is incomplete, meaning there's some corner case you didn't handle, something, some functionality that you, you didn't finish yet, it should be clearly documented with fix me or to-do labels and explain what, you, what, you know, what is missing, what's going on. Because a lot of you ask me whether you can come do a capstone project or independent study in the fall. And a lot of you said you want to pick up where you worked on the class and work on, work on the fall you know, you know, as, your, as, as this independent study. So if there's some feature that you didn't implement correctly or finish off, uh, unless you document it, when you come back in the fall, after you spent all the time at LinkedIn and Facebook and Google eating all their free food, you're not going to remember what the hell you actually did back in May when you're trying to scramble and finish up the project. So it's in your own interest, if you want to work on these things, to document what's, what, what you did, what, where you left off. So that way you come back in the fall and you, you can pick up right, right where you left off. So this is really important and, and, you know, to, to, to make sure we do. And the last one is that we want to make sure that everyone has, has proper tests for, for their new implementations. Right, so you want to look to see whether the tests actually exist and whether they actually call and say the thing, they're testing the things that they say they're testing. Um, you want to make sure that they're not relying on hard-coded answers. I'm not saying for this project, but I've done other projects in the past where I've seen students like have the code write print out statements that they then capture in the test to see, make sure that those print out statements appeared. All right, stupid things like that you want to avoid. You want to make sure that everything is 
you know, if someone changes the implement high level or low level implementation of a feature, your test can still uh, check for those things. And then the last one is you want to make sure that you have good coverage of, of your code in your tests. So we didn't really talk about code coverage in the class, but the basic idea of, of code coverage is a metric that allows you to uh, assess what percentage of the actual implementation code is actually tested by the test code, right? And so in, if you, you may have not seen this, but in Jenkins, for all, all of you guys here, for your projects, when, you, when it actually builds your, 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 your code, when you commit to GitHub, it actually computes a code coverage um, uh, a table. So this is for our system here. And it's kind of hard to see here, but here's all the directories for in our, in our system. And then this over here is a percentage of what lines of the code that's actually, that's actually executed by the test cases and what functions are actually executed. So down here, they're all green because of like near 98% because this is the test code itself, right? Obviously, the test code has to execute. So that's counted. But all this other stuff up here is parts of the code that were not fully tested. So you may ask, well, what's the, what's the right number? What should I shoot for? And it obviously depends. The more, the better. But I will say that you can't see it here, but these two lines, the, the yellows, are 84% and 80, 88%. This corresponds to the concurrency control system and the execution engine system, right? All this other stuff is, is networking, which we're not really using yet. And certainly the Postgres code, we're not, we're not testing fully because we're slowly getting rid of that. So I would say that you kind of want to be up in the 80s, high 80s if possible. 100% would be amazing, but that's, you know, that's un unrealistic. So again, when you write your tests and you run this in, uh, in Jenkins, or even from the command line, it, it'll generate this information for you, and you can see for the, the code you're reviewing what coverage they have for their tests. And again, email us, join I, if you ask questions about how, how to access this, access this information. And this is automatically done for you on Jenkins. You don't have to do anything extra. Okay. So for the for the pairing off the groups, I tried to group together or paired off groups that were working on parts of the code that were somewhat similar, right? So the logging team will review the multi-threaded guys, the constraint team will review the, the collection, UDF, some memcache, query planning, current control, statistics, and query compilation, right? And so uh, I'll post this on Piazza again. It's on the, uh, it's on the actually, the, the Google Doc spreadsheet as well. It'll tell you who, who you're assigned to. And you want to contact them when it comes time to do the code review and say, you know, where is it? All right, any questions? Again, it's not meant to be very taxing. It's, just, it's, it's, it's really meant to be an exercise to help improve you as, as a programmer, as a software developer, as a database developer. Right? You'll learn from other people. You'll learn you know, new ideas about how they code things. And you know, it's, it's, it's not meant to freak you out. OK? So that's it for lectures. Uh, on next class on Monday, I'll start off in the, in the beginning with doing a, uh, a quick review on what sort of would be expected on the final exam that's on Wednesday next week. And as I said, I'll provide you guys on, over Piazza two sample questions of what the kind of questions I'm going to ask. Uh, there'll be three questions on, on, the, on the exam. And they're like short or short essays. Right, so I'm not going to ask you multiple choice things. I'm going to ask you to sort of think about and, uh, and combine the different topics that we talked about in the course and apply them, you know, do some critical thinking and apply them to, you know, to, to these questions. And then we'll spend the rest of the time in the, in the class uh, with a guest lecture or a, a tech talk from Ankur Goya, who is CMU alum, but he's also, I think, employee number three or four at MemSQL. He's now the VP Engineering. So I've asked him to come talk about their new query compilation engine uh, in MemSQL that came out in MemSQL 5.0. Um, and I, th I think it's really interesting and it goes well beyond what, what we talked about in the course. All right? So any questions? We're done. All right, thanks, guys.